we all know why we're here today. So as we talk through some of these issues, let's please just try to keep the emotion out of it. I, I don't know what to do anymore. I'm considering filing for termination for default. More like for convenience. What? What? I didn't, what? What? I didn't, I didn't say that. I, I mean, you, you like always okay, 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 okay. okay. Let's not jump to any drastic actions yet. Industry, why don't you begin? All right, well, for starters, she's late for everything. Okay, government, how about you? Easy. First, he always promises things he can't deliver. He always tries to find a reason to pick a fight with me. He tells me he supports me on things. And then he goes with his friends and he makes fun of me for it. Everything seems to be about money for him. More important than the things that I think are important. And last but not least, he is not the person that I agreed to partner with. He's like a completely different person. All right, all right, okay. All right, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. I'll change. All right. I'm so glad we were able to find a compromise here. I'll just get what I need in modification anyway. What? Okay, so it's a pretty aggressive title, Five Reasons the Government Hates You, but really the purpose of this video is to help you establish a good relationship with the government. Now there are some things that get under the government's skin that contractors can do. So one disclaimer, the government is supposed to look at each proposal that comes in on its own merits. And if they're wrangled by a particular company or they've had bad experiences, they're really not supposed to uh, let that affect their judgment. But we know the reality, we know how human beings think, and books that have come out like Thinking Fast and Slow really talk about this intuitive judgment that comes in that affects the way we make our decisions. So let's start with number one. So number one, you promise things that you cannot deliver, or the over-promiser. Now, this tends to happen most often when you take on too much in your proposal. Sometimes it's because you're overzealous to win a contract. You really want to win, so you, again, take on too much. Sometimes it's when you bid on a poorly drafted government requirement, like a lowest price technically acceptable that's poorly defined. Many times it's because you don't understand the government's needs and environment. Maybe something worked in the commercial field, but it doesn't work in the government. You did not understand that before you made your promises that you could deliver. So, what are some things that you can do to prevent yourself from being this over-promiser? Well, I mean, the, the obvious one is just to be realistic in your proposal about what you can do. Now, that's not to say that you can go for areas that you haven't done before. You just got to make sure you have the resources to do so. Another thing is to really understand the government environment, the government requirements, so things that would work maybe in the commercial side may not be a perfect fit when you're trying to put your capability into a government mission. And finally, I would say just know when not to bid. Some requirements are set up where you'll bid really, really low on something and the government will expect just excellent performance. And if they're not specific about what they want, it could cause you to accidentally overpromise something. So just be smart about what you're putting your bids in for. Number two, you protest for the wrong reasons or the frivolous protester. Now, sometimes it may be that you have a lawyer on retainer, so it's no cost to you if you decide to take a shot for it and see if you win. Sometimes you just go for what's called a you know shotgun accusations, where you, you, know, you spit out a whole bunch of accusations and hope that this one you know one sticks. Uh, and the worst offender, you're the losing incumbent. You lost the recompete, and you know that if you protest there'll be an injunction, or in other words, they'll stop everything and the agency will be forced to keep paying you all the months until the protest is worked out. Okay, so how to not be a frivolous protester? Well, I think the actions here are pretty easy. 
you should take advantage of the protest system. It's a really good system. It keeps the integrity of the procurement system sound. And if you have a reason or even a suspicion, you should hold the contracting office accountable for that. But make sure your reasons for protesting are legitimate reasons. Think about the resources and time that the government sacrifices to prepare for a protest. If it's not a legitimate reason, it's not a very good look that you're wasting that kind of time. Number three, you send different messages or the two-faced talker. Now, sometimes this is when you say one thing to one agency and you talk to another government agency with a different message or to the public with a different message. Usually this is negatively talking about another agency. So you have to be careful because government folks do talk to one another sometimes. And what that could end up is you losing trust with the government. And sometimes that lost trust could even end up with them losing trust in everything you say in your proposals, even things that you say that you'll do in your proposals. You lose credibility. So how to prevent yourself from being, or even having the appearance of being kind of a two-faced uh, company? Well, I mean, the action's easy here too. Be the same kind of company behind closed door meetings as you are in public. Now, my previous government job, I've had over 15 years of experience. I've been a contracting officer. I've led contract offices and acquisition offices. And this is something I have seen in companies. So when I see one company say something in public, and then that same company is singing a different tune behind closed doors at a meeting in the Pentagon, it's not a great look. Just be consistent. Number four, you put the transaction over the mission or the money over mission partner. Now, this has been a historical issue all the way back from the Revolutionary War and the war profiteers. There's even been accounts of some companies who would raise up prices knowing that some soldiers would die just because they would take advantage of the market. Now, that's on the extreme side. But the point is that, you know, the, the short-term profit that you try to make if you do a money grab could have long-term effects, even scrutiny from Congress about your practices. You also lose the appearance of being a team member. Now, the greatest example of team member was in the NASA and the Apollo missions between the companies and NASA. Now, they had their problems, but they worked together for a common mission. Okay, so how, how can you prevent yourself from looking like you care more about a transaction over the government mission. This one's a little hard because you do have a responsibility to make a profit and you should make a profit and you should look for those transactions. But you wanna make sure that you show that you're caring about that mission that you're a part of. Now, it doesn't have to be overt patriotism. I've worked with a lot of tech companies that would definitely not wear American flags you know, on their blazer or anything like that. But you can tell they knew what exactly we, what we wanted and that their service was connected to accomplishing that mission. And every now and then they would make comments like that. Number five, you bait and switch on your proposals or the bait and switcher. Now, usually this is unintentional. It's the easiest problem for you to fall into because unfortunately, many government agencies take a long time to, to get to their award, which means that you're proposal can get stale. Sometimes this is switching functionality, so something you proposed earlier on that you can do, when you're actually awarded the contract, you find out maybe that functionality is not there. It's especially common in key personnel. So people that you say that are gonna be available, even people that you introduce in maybe kickoff meetings after the award, you find out they're not so available during the uh, performance process. So how not to be a bait and switcher? This is a challenging problem because as we, we mentioned earlier, the government does take a long time sometimes to award a contract. And when you actually, if you win the contract and you need to perform, sometimes those resources you said were available may not be available. Well, this goes a little bit back to not being an overpromiser. You just need to be realistic. Sets the times in your proposal in which that proposal is effective and stick to those times. If you have on the personnel side, really high level subject matter personnel, recommend maybe suggesting that they're reach back support. They're not gonna be maybe key personnel, but let the government know you have them in your arsenal and they'll be available for any advice. So hopefully this video was helpful for you. There's actually a whole bunch of reasons uh, that the company can get under the government's skin. So we could come up with more. If you did find this video helpful, let us know by subscribing, commenting, 
And there's a lot of reasons why government loves companies. So we could make a video about that too. Five reasons the government loves you. So if you're interested in that, just let us know. We'll keep making content. Thanks. Acquisition's hard, but it doesn't have to be. Whether you're from government or industry, if you're looking for solutions to your hard problems, click the link below to schedule a chat. We'd love to hear from you.